Okay, uh, well, uh, let's get going and let people join. I see they're still they're still entering, but we will um, kick off now. It is my great pleasure to uh, welcome a regular attendee and and discussant at these workshops uh, webinars. But but um, great to have him leading uh, on the consequences of weak monetary policy, learning from the Turkish uh, experience. We have. Uh, Rafet Gurkanyak of Bill Kent and of the CEPR, head of the Monetary Economics uh, and Fluctuations Group in the CEPR. So uh, he and I were joking before we joined that uh, in this case, uh, he is my boss in, in my CEPR sense, but equally uh, I'm in charge of this webinar. So I... Uh, uh, we, we, we're on some more even footing right now. But no, Rafet, it's fantastic to have you. Um, as usual, we will aim to go until... Um, if you speak for about 45 minutes, 50 minutes, there'll be questions as we go. Uh, Rafet has told me that um, he especially encourages questions. There's bits that that of this talk that will require a bit of knowledge of, of Turkey. And if you don't know something, ah. And so I will be doing that. I will monitor it. But if you have questions uh, from, from the wider audience, put them in the Q&A. But otherwise, without further ado, Rafet, do you want to share your slides and we'll kick off? But of course. All right. Um, so it's a it's a great pleasure to be here as a presenter. And it, let me take a moment to thank Michael for the outstanding public service uh, he's doing by organizing the seminar series. This is one that had legs, right? You know, a lot of people start online seminar series and then they last for, I don't know, one, two, three, five episodes and then they die. This one has been going on for, I guess, years now, right? Um, and for good reason. It really is excellent. I look forward to it, and I really appreciate your doing this and the invitation. Now, um, San Burcin and I are all at Bilkent uh, and all with CPR, and we often work together and we often talk about, you know, what is going on around us in Turkey too. But rarely does the research interest and the interest in the country come together the way it has here. Um, and this really started out as us wanting to effectively write down what we understand of the Turkish experience for posterity. Um, and it turned into a paper that actually makes some hopefully useful points, in particular, talking about how to properly think about neo-fisherian inflation and disinflation. So um, I'm going to spend an inordinate amount of time on this outline to talk about what is in the paper. And what is in the paper is a whole bunch of disparate bits about, you know, look, if you completely go crazy on monetary policy, here are some of the things that one could imagine uh, observing. And Turkey is a good case to see whether that actually has happened or not. One way to look at this is to ask how would one think of a genuine, long-lasting application of the neo-fisherian, let me call it paradigm? And if you don't know what the neo-fisherian paradigm is, you will in a minute. Okay. But in the paper, we have this long discussion, and that came afterwards. We wrote everything else. I actually presented this paper once, and I realized that there are bits and pieces where I don't know what I'm talking about. In my mind, it hadn't come together, actually. Um, so we sat down, and worked it out. Um, it's not mechanically difficult, but it's economically very elegant. If you know it, it's obvious to you. If you don't, the paper is fairly nice in explaining this. So I'm gonna spend some time on that, okay? Um, then um, one of the more important things here is as economists, as applied economists, we spend so much time trying to find exogenous variation, okay? And it's difficult to find in micro data. It's even more difficult to find in macro data. And the Turkish case is a very clear, massive exogenous macro policy shift. So we show that it was exogenous. That is, the monetary policy change wasn't because you know the Turkish economy was doing badly, growth was low. It wasn't because uh, of fiscal pressures. It really was you know the prime minister at the time, the president now, saying, "I want lower interest rates." OK, um, and he wasn't saying this because the economy needed lower interest rates, but he needed lower interest rates for political reasons. His beliefs and understanding of the economy said, 
you know, lower interest rates are always good. Um, and living in a world of tax short as a citizen is quite terrible. As an economist, it doesn't get better than that, right? Because, we, you know, which of us didn't want some policymaker making up in the morning and saying, okay, you know, for the hell of it, we're going to lower interest rates by 800 basis points, okay? That's the Turkish monetary policy experiment, and that's for more than a decade, right? Um, one of the things that we can really do, I'm going to spend very little time on this, but it's really cool, is, you know, personal power parity is one of these things that when you teach it to undergraduates, they love it because it's so obvious, okay? Uh, and then you have to break their hearts and say, uh, the data hates this, right? In my world, it's two things. It's PPP and the expectations hypothesis that the students very quickly understand. They see that it's a very basic arbitrage relationship and they're like, ah, nice, yes, this should be. And then for both of them, you have to say, yeah, the data hates it, okay? Now, for the PPP bit though, the testing actually is a bit iffy because if you look at the literature, it's all about, you know, we're going to look at the, I don't know, um, the, the pound dollar exchange rate, the Deutsche Mark, one of yen exchange rate, the dollar euro exchange rate, okay? Now, the inflation differentials are when inflation here was, you know, the 1.8% and the inflation there was 2.2%. So let's see whether the exchange rate changed by 0.4%, right? Now, a tiny amount of friction makes the exchange rate not change that much. But... Those of you who have a applied econometrics bent will readily see that lack of variation in your independent variable is always a problem in these things. Okay. And the Turkish case says, okay, you know, rather than you know two and a half percent here and you know 2.7% there, how about three percent here and 35% there? Okay, when the inflation differentials are that big, do I see something resembling PPP? Okay, and the answer is wow the data screams it's PPP, okay? Um, in fact, so much so that if you think of a bivariate system in which you're using inflation to have forecast the exchange rate, you can meet and beat the Misi Rogoff random walk benchmark, which to my knowledge is about impossible in well-behaved inflation episodes, okay? Um, this one I'm gonna skip. But a natural question is, you know, if it wasn't the inflation that made the central bank move, if it wasn't the fiscal pressures, what the hell was it, right? Um, and the answer really is, you know, look, um, the country had been moving and then very formally moved into a one-man show and that one man just wanted low interest rates, period, okay? And that we can show. Then it gets interesting because then we can begin to talk about, okay, so you're... I am telling you that the central bank was keeping the interest rates artificially low. That is still something that we can interpret through the lens of a Taylor rule. And in particular, that's going to imply the Taylor principle will not be satisfied. We can show that it was not satisfied. Um, but then what is that we expect to see? And there are various ways of thinking about this. One is, you know, indeterminacy, anything goes, okay? That's fine, but that's clearly not what we are observing actually. And it's clearly not something that we have, I would say ever observed in the sense that countries where central bank is politically stifled and cannot raise interest rates, you never see these countries have, you know, huge deflations. It's always prices going up, but not down. And that's not, you know, Ooh, indeterminacy, anything can happen. It's not anything happen. It's always up, 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 okay? Um, now, one way to talk about this is, yeah, you know, it so happens that expectations, focal points, people expect inflation might be, okay? But our beloved New Keynesian frameworks actually stop being very useful when we push it into indeterminacy, which we don't want to. We, we actually want the model to give us some answers, okay? And, and in particular, one of the interesting things here is that I want to think about something resembling, say, impulse responses, but that requires determinacy of some sort. And I cannot go into a fully, you know, anything goes world. So in the model, I'm going to impose some sort of determinacy. But it's not going to be only because, you know, I'm not smart enough to work with a model with indeterminacy but also because 
there is this other thing where, you know, if you come to Turkey now, or if you've been to the country in the past decade, you would be doing your shopping with Turkish liras. Now, it's a great question. Why on earth does this currency still function as currency? There was a great presentation by Luca Benati uh, this summer at the Emir Samun Institute that said um, the Lefri curve actually doesn't kick in at any level of monetization, meaning you know countries can go. And he was looking at the um, interwar, but you know Hungary and 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 Germany, so that level of you know insane uh, inflation. And he was saying, you know, look. Um, if you look at it with the machinery we now have available with proper econometric tools, it's clear that, okay, perhaps th there is a concavity there, but it's an increasing function. You print money, you get seniors. You print more money, you get more seniors. People actually use that money. And that's kind of understandable, right? Because you have this whole, whole bunch of public servants, you know, if they want to be paid, they have to be paid in liras, you have to pay your taxes, whatnot. So these things that we talk about, you know, why is there money? They actually apply, meaning people actually choose to hold the currency. But if they choose to hold the currency, they must believe that the value isn't going to zero. Okay. Two ways of modeling this. One is people think that sanity will prevail, and therefore this is a regime shifting world. Okay. This we can model. We do model. And then we can say, okay, imagine that you're in a regime that currently the Taylor principle isn't satisfied, but with a large enough probability, a strong enough monetary policy rule is somewhere in the horizon. And therefore, globally, this is determinate, and I can work with this model. That I can work with. The problem with a model of that sort is in the weak model, any kind of inflation shock is, as you would expect, amplified. But you cannot, by the definition of a shock, only have shocks that push inflation up. There has to be disinflationary shocks too, which in the weak regime have to lead to inflation going too low. Again, that's not in the data. So one of our contributions, um, sadly in the context of a country that we very much love, is to think about a model of effective upper bound. Those of you who have worked with models of the effective lower bound will immediately understand this, right? You know, throughout the past decade in a lot of advanced economies, we observed and thought about what happens if you hit a bound on the interest rates on the low side where you can't lower the policy rate further, okay? Now, that bound is because of a participation constraint, right? If you push the interest rates too much into negative, people say, you know, damn it, just give me the cash. Right? Hence, you cannot do it. Now, the upper bound, of course, isn't a constraint of that sort. If you raise interest rates too much, people don't stop playing the game, so to speak. But it's very reasonable to say, you know, that's exactly what political pressure is. It doesn't stop you from lowering interest rates, but it does stop you from raising them. That's directional now, it's asymmetric. And very easily, you can show that in a world of that sort, you're gonna end up with inflation going up like crazy, but not going down like crazy. What is neat here is these are essentially fairly standard tweaks of the new Keynesian model. And the subtitle of this paper, which is, has either just come out or is coming out in economic policy, is Turkey verifies theory. Turkey verifies theory in the sense that if your understanding of the world is guided by some basic open economy, new Keynesian model, say um, Claire de Galigurtler style thinking, that thinking actually is very good. And it isn't very good only in the cases where, you know, um, policy is sane, good, um, various regulatory co um, conditions are satisfied in a very nice way, right? Because that model actually has implications for craziness too. And those implications are born in the data as Turkey helpfully showed. Then I'll try to get to this bit. Um, in the fall of 2021, we went completely haywire and the central bank said, okay, we will actually begin to not only not raise rates, but we'll begin to cut interest rates because they didn't say it in these words, but because we're told to, okay? And, and that's a fascinating episode 
our analysis actually, normal analysis ends before then, just so that that craziness isn't carrying everything. But we have a whole bunch of event studies there that I'd like to tell you about. Okay, so that's what the paper is. And my presentation is going to pick bits and pieces of this. But if you're interested in parts that I'm not going to talk about, um, there is a very accessible Vox EU column that we put out, I guess, last week, uh, which I think Michael has um, shared the link to. And, and then there is the full paper that is on our web pages and in economic policy. All right. Now, the thinking begins. Uh, at, with that, with that, just, yes. just before you go there, can I, can I just ask one thing? Because um, I, I guess the bit that's not currently, and I know you haven't gotten fully to it yet, but uh, the upper bound regime um, is, I, I can understand that that causes inflation not to be controlled in some sense, but it's still not clear to me how that helps get us to a point where it's like there's a terminal condition in the model, um, which which the regime switching idea does, right? So if I think, yeah, the world will head off on some path towards a horrible place, but along that path, there'll be whatever systematic change needs to happen for us to re-instill some kind of dynamic discipline on the system. Very good. So essentially what happens is the rate cannot go up as much as it should, but it can stay at the upper bound for longer than it normally would have, right? Um, and But for this to work, you need kind of well-ish behaved shocks, right? Because if you get these sequence of up, 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 up shocks, but they shouldn't because again, the shock definition precludes that. I am able to control the interest rate by hitting the upper bound and then staying there for longer than I would normally keep interest rates up, right? Fine. Um, okay. So, so, yeah. So, so that's so, kind of how it works. Fine. But so, so a little bit uh, part of the, the the risk with that strategy, and again, I'm going to pull this back now to the debate, say in the UK on policy here, right? It is it, based on the same logic. This idea of Table Mountain versus the Matterhorn. You Very know, good. This is the this is the idea that in our in our standard New Keynesian models, um, you know, inflation today is a function of all the discounted real interest rate gaps through their effect on the output gap. But but what's missing, I guess, or the worry about what's missing is some nonlinearity that if we if we don't yep. get it under control quick enough, we do go sort of to the to the room. absolutely. And I'm going to show you a graph that's not in the paper. That's kind of fascinating. Um, on the weird things that central banks begin to do when they begin to worry about these things. Um, okay, and cool. for those of you who um, haven't been to South Africa, Table Mountain is a mountain in Cape Town that has a very flat top. Um, and so it helps explain you know, some of the interest rate movements. All right, so what you're looking at is the Fisher equation. This is an identity. It is the definition of the real interest rate. Okay. Uh, Rafet, just quickly, could, yes. could you get rid of the it, go full screen again? It's gone. Yes. There you go. All right. And, you know, this thing has to be satisfied at all times. Hence, it has to be satisfied at steady state. And what turns this identity from the definition of the real interest rate to a theory is the bit where someone says, and at steady state, the real interest rate is exogenous to monetary policy. Now, today we have models where it isn't, but we're going to stay in the world where it is. Okay, So the real interest rate depends on the marginal product of capital, the growth rate of the economy, which at steady state, now we assume, is independent of monetary policy. If that is so, our start is whatever it is. That's, that says, if therefore at steady state, the nominal interest rate, which at steady state is still a policy variable, is lower, given our bar is exogenous, it must be that pi bar has to be lower. Okay, this is called one version of the Fisher effect. We're not new Fisherian yet. Okay, what turns this into the new Fisherian theory is a kind of weird marriage of this idea with the new Keynesian model, and this is elegantly done, but um, I would say unhelpfully narrated by. Um, Uribe and Uribe and Shimit Grohi. So they have a series of papers on this, where they say, you know, look, 
if this is the case, and the Phillips curve, the expectations augmented Phillips curve is there, then if I'm able to commit to low interest rates in the far future, which is going to lower the pi bar, future inflation, the backwards induction embedded in the expectations augmented Phillips curve implies that inflation today is going to go down. Thus, by lowering interest rates and committing to not raising them, I can lower inflation, not only at steady state, but also now, okay? Now, they make this point and they say that this is actually in the data as well. And I'm gonna come back to this in a minute, all right? Good. And, and our question is, you know, can this really work? In theory, how does this fit? And in application, what does it look like? In application, what it looks like is Turkey, okay? Um, and, but let's think about the theory first. And if you haven't taught in these terms, hopefully this is going to be useful for you. So what is useful here is to analyze this new Fisherian idea through the lens of the Taylor rule. And people usually don't do this. The reason why this is so useful is this. The Taylor rule, this equation, this is not an identity, but it has to be satisfied in every period too. The interest rate is set as some function of the steady state interest rate. And I'm making life easy here by saying, let's have a policy rule that is only in terms of the inflation deviation, okay? Some perhaps time varying policy reaction coefficient, the inflation gap, and then a shock, okay? Now, here, the question is, if IT is lower, and it's going to be low forever, how is this equation still satisfied, okay? Let's begin with how it cannot be satisfied. It can't be that the shock is negative and will always be negative. Again, by construction, this is a mean zero shock. You can't rely on a forever negative stream of shocks to the Taylor rule to have a lower interest rate, okay? So it has to come from here. One way where it is satisfied is, imagine that the new Fisherian idea actually works. So what happens is I come to you and say, you know what, say nothing is happening, or in fact, even better, inflation that is pi t is higher than my target. And here I'm making the target the same as the steady state inflation, pi bar, okay? So this gap is positive. I want to lower inflation today, and I'm gonna do it by lowering the nominal rate forever, okay? Now, something that could happen is you say, ooh, okay, steady state inflation is going to go down, pi bar is going to go down. Phillips curve implies that future inflation differentials are going to be lower, and therefore I'm not going to raise my prices as much today, so pi t also goes down. Notice, notice that if that happens, one, inflation has gone down, but two, this gap hasn't changed. The inflation target and actual inflation has gone down as much, okay? But note that pi bar is here too. It's part of the steady state interest rate too. Pi bar has gone down and therefore a low inflation target and a low interest rate are reinforcing each other. I have equilibrium. The Taylor rule is satisfied. What is the crux of the matter in analyzing the neo Fisherian disinflation in this way is to understand that in this narrative, causality does not go from lower interest rates to lower steady state inflation target to lower inflation. It goes from lower steady state inflation target to lower inflation to lower interest rates. That is, if you are able to convince people that inflation will be on a lower path forever, then you can correspondingly lower the interest rate too, okay? And that is why this paper is in the communication series. If you can sell this, that works. Now, can you sell it by saying, look, I'm lowering the interest rate and over my dead body, am I going to raise them again? I don't know. It may work. And if it works, good for you. But there is nothing in this thought systematic that says, if a central banker comes out and says, I'm gonna lower interest rates and keep them low forever, the public must lower their inflation expectations path. 
So the great question is, what happens if you do this? And the public says, ha, I don't think steady state inflation has changed actually. Okay, what if the public refuses to cooperate in expectation? So, 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 Rafa, just just to just to jump in there, then. So, 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 in a way, this is this is a, 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 a in my view, very fair, but maybe others would not think so fair. But um, you know, it's a criticism of the extent of the information and credibility of the information shared and the credibility of the central bank in our new Keynesian models, the models which we use for a lot of this analysis, where. You know, if the central bank does it, everyone believes they'll do it. And once you get to that commitment, it's great. Sure. Yes. I mean, again, um, remember also that, of course, you know this very well, you know, the zero dollar bound is a non-issue under commitment, right? Um, the, the whole problem arises when people don't think that you're able to commit all that well. So that applies here in the other direction, too. That's absolutely correct. Now... But, but the question remains, imagine that the central bank comes and says, okay, you know, here, lower interest rates. And people go, you know, I don't think pi bar has gone down, all right? Um, note that pi bar actually has gone down in this case. If the central bank will keep the interest rate low forever, you have created a steady state with a lower inflation, but expectations haven't caught up with that, okay? But the question remains, then what happens? It's still the case that it can't be a sequence of negative shocks, okay? But pi bar hasn't gone down. The only way this is going to work is if the public revise their expectations of the policy transmission parameter downwards. The only way this works is the public says, you're crazy. You're lowering interest rates because you don't care about inflation. And now the Taylor rule is satisfied, okay? And the problem there, of course, is if you make the public say pi bar, the phi pi, the policy reaction function is lower, you're pushing yourself into the indeterminacy region. And that's the big issue, okay? And in fact, that's the reason why that lower, uh, lower inflation steady state and inflation going crazy become consistent. Because if you are actually committing to a low interest rate path, you have created the Fisherian at steady state lower inflation, but you no longer have the saddle path to that steady state. The world has become self-fulfilling, so you're gonna jump around. In a sense, house life to the steady state has become infinity because you're gonna jump around forever now, okay? So the Fisher equation is still correct, but the Neo-Fisherian experiment has failed and the Fisher equation isn't saving you anymore, okay? And that's the thing that uh, took us quite a while to wrap our minds around how the identity is still correct, but inflation isn't going down, right? Good. So now we can use this mindset to look at Turkey, okay? Um, there. One thing that one has to be cognizant of is that the Turkish fiscal situation was very good. We can date the beginning of this madness to 2010-ish, and I can tell you the political economy story of that too, which is interesting actually. But notice that we're looking at a time when despite the global financial crisis uptick, you have debt to GDP that is at 40% and going down, okay? It's in this environment that the government pressured the central bank to lower interest rates. Not only the debt to GDP was doing very well and the fiscal balance was healthy, the markets perceived it as such too. So the Turkish CDS spreads were at their historic um, lows. Turkey became investment grade somewhere here. And then, you know, the rating companies, they're always lagging. So they realize that the country has gone crazy. So slowly and slowly and then fastly and fastly, um, we lost the investment grade, okay? But the key here is you cannot find a fiscal reason for the monetary policy action here. So what you're observing isn't a fiscal theory of the price level type inflation. It really is exogenous pressure on the central bank for non-fiscal and non-macroeconomic reasons, okay? Now, this, I apologize for the Turkish title. This is from a different paper of mine, but we had a paragraph that I had put in into the Vox EU column 
that my uh, esteemed colleagues made me take out that talked about this, okay? You know, here are some of the policies that the Central Bank of Turkey carried out where it was such a convoluted set of policies that communication became impossible. Nobody understood what the policy stance of the Central Bank of Turkey was. The issue is this. One of the reasons why we know this was exogenous is while the central bank was not raising the policy rate or gently lowering the policy rate, they were inventing all kinds of backdoor ways of tightening the policy stance. These at the time were good central bankers, who good economists who understood what the Turkish economy needed. They didn't have sufficient backbone to say no to the government. So on the one hand, they were you know, lowering the policy rate. On the other hand, they were changing various implementation methods and regulations so that the fallout from that will be minimized. What you're looking at here is this thick black line is the so-called policy rate. Okay. The dashed lines are the two ends of the policy corridor. And the thin black line is the overnight rate in the interbank market. Okay, so this is the effective rate. So up to 2010 or so, what you see is, you know, like any other standard central banking framework, okay, the Turkish um, corridor was asymmetric, fine, right? But the interbank rate was very close to the policy rate, as it should be. That's the whole point of the policy rate, okay? Then what happens? Then somewhere here, okay, and take my word for it, this is a period where the global financial crisis effects in the Turkish economy are over. We are now at or about potential GDP. The government is pressuring the central bank to cut the policy rate, which it duly does. That's here. Okay. They cut the policy rate at a time where inflation is above their target already, and then say, but we're going to make the corridor very wide. So the corridor you're looking at here is about seven, eight percentage points wide, okay? And in the release, they say, and we're gonna let the effective rate, the interbank rate, bang around in that corridor randomly, which is what you see here, okay? Now, this is the central bank's way of saying, we understand that we are making policy too accommodative, too expansionary, and we understand that what is really needed is a contraction, and we understand that the second moment uncertainty is contractionary. So we're going to lower the first moment and make it expansionary and then extend the variance of the policy, the effective rate. And we're going to use that as the contractionary method. Okay. If you think that this is beautiful, it really is, but that's because you're an economist and not a citizen here. Okay. That of course doesn't work well. And, and the internet market is a mess. Then they say, okay, we're not going to do this anymore. There is this great moment here where they cut the rates, okay? And then there's a great amount of pressure here for them to raise it because now they are beginning to lose control of inflation, okay? They don't. And when they don't raise the rates, the minister in charge of the economy, Zafar Chalayan, is on TV 10 minutes later saying, well, congratulations to the central bank for listening to what we told them. You know, that's the good government body that does the bidding of the government, blah, 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 right? Um, and I tell my first year students, first year undergraduates, this is why you're studying economics so that you're not making fools of yourself like this guy, because in the release, it says, we're making the policy corridor asymmetric again in the other direction. So now you're looking at about a eight or 10 percentage point corridor here where they say, Okay, this is the policy rate, some number, but we will allow the interbank rate to trade close to the top end of the corridor. Meaning this actually has become the policy rate now, and this is just a random number, okay? And this is, look at this, right? This is about the 600 basis point rate hike, okay? So it's like bloodshed in the market, Banks are livid that they are hit with this. The government, they so don't understand basic macroeconomics that you know they're very happy to see that this rate is still here. Okay. Now, in a couple of 
places that I don't show you, in a couple of years, the government eventually catches up to the fact that the top end of the corridor has become the policy rate. So they pressure the central bank to lower that, which being backboneless, the central bank does, then tells the banks, you know what? We don't have to fund you at the top end of the corridor either. The Turkish system is a scarcity system. So the bank, you know, if the central bank isn't providing the liquidity, the banking system as a whole cannot close their books. So the banks, this is language Michael really likes, banks are scared shitless, okay? You know, how are we going to end the day? Now, you know, this is not the US where you have 6,000 banks. This is, you know, proper civilized Europe where you have, you know, 10 banks. So you can actually call every single bank, which is what they had done. The central bank actually had called every central bank and said, you know what? We don't have to fund you at the top end of the corridor either. And the bank said, you know, what the hell? What do we do? And the central bank said, there's always the discount window. Because in Turkish, this is called, in Turkey, this is the late liquidity window. This is the after hours, a bank saying, you know, I was unable to fund myself through market means. So I'm willing to borrow at a huge penalty rate, okay? That's not a monetary policy, anything. It really is a macroprudential liquidity regulation facility that the central bank turned into a basic monetary policy tool so that they could use the spread between that and the top end of the corridor to tighten while keeping the top end of the corridor low. Now, you could immediately see that this is a mess. There is no way you can talk about central bank communication, transparency, you know, people understanding mandate, whatever. It's just a huge mess. Personally, it was very good for me because you know, whoever wanted to do any business in Turkey had to come to me and you know, pay me so that I explain to them what is going on and what the central bank stance is and how to read the policy framework. But this is no monetary policy. Why was the central bank doing this? Because they knew their normal policy stance was essentially orthogonal to the needs of the Turkish macroeconomy. That's the sense in which this is truly exogenous policy rule shift. It's not a shock to the policy rule. It's the change of the policy rule. Okay? Good. Then uh, I'm going to skip these. Can I, just, Go can, ahead. I, yes. can I jump in with two things there? One is, uh, one is a question, the other is a comment. Uh, the, the comment, and you may have heard this before, is just to say that, I mean, I wrote a paper a few years ago with some colleagues at the IMF, not, not doing any real research, but just looking at how the Chinese, the PBOC um, monetary policy worked. And, and, and they had settled into a what, what I would think of as a sort of similar situation where officially the government, the party would tell people what the rate is, but then unofficially the bank would still implement something that was slightly more attuned to the high frequency adjusting needs than once a year, a big announcement. And so at the time, I don't know what it's like now, you've got these weird graphs where the policy rate was up here and all of the market rates were below it and, and, and moving around, even though the policy rate was not. That's just a comment of a, a sort of a similarity where I think for whatever political economy reasons, you get central banks trying to, to, to do the economist thing. But maybe my question is more political, so feel free to skip it. Why, why do you think it took so long for the, the, the politicians to figure out that their, their big announcements on the policy rate were not actually effective in a sense, right? The, that they were being usurped by as clever central bankers? Um, it's a combination of the economy was growing like gangbusters, which is an interesting question on its own right. So, you know, if we're stagnating, they would have seen this much faster, okay? Um, and, and credit growth was, you know, very large too. That's some of it. And some of it is they actually did not have the expertise, right? You know, the president himself doesn't know it. And uh, he had surrounded himself with yes men whose main ability was not to understand basic macroeconomics. So there you had it. Yeah. Okay. okay. So I'm just going to show you a quick graph here. So what you're looking at is... These um, green lines are averages of, let me call them fellow comparable emerging market economies, okay? For 
their price levels and their exchange rates. And then the bluish ones are for Turkey. And what you can immediately see is, you know, it wasn't in 2021 that Turkey was different. It really became, you know, way back here. Okay. The other one is that, you know, when the price level path went haywire, the exchange rate path went haywire too. Those two lines actually work fairly closely together. Okay. And that's your PPP. Now we can properly test this because there are all kinds of, but you know, inflation was very high at this beginning point and it was coming down. Um, and then it was going back up again. So this initial condition actually made a difference, whatever. So we have the machinery to address these things and you can set up a bivariate system and test it. I'm not going to show this or show you the results apart from saying, you know, if you use a machine of this sort to ask what is the correlation of the filtered shocks to inflation and the exchange rate change, okay? The answer is unity. It's not near one, it's one, okay? That really is PPP. All right. Um, these, these I'm gonna skip. If you're interested, you can take a look at these things. There are some fascinating bits there, but let's look at this, okay? Let's have a proper Taylor rule with a time varying coefficient here and the time varying coefficient for the output gap uh, and uh, time varying steady states and use a common filter to back out that policy parameter for inflation, okay? That's the middle panel that you're looking at. Let me take a second here to say, this is not entirely kosher because our current econometrics actually tells us not to run, this is a common filter, but it doesn't matter. You know, you could think of this as OLS um, and, and immediately see that, look, the whole point of OLS is the orthogonality of the independent variable with the shock, okay, with the other term. Whole point of the new Keynesian model is to tell you that inflation and the monetary policy shock aren't orthogonal to each other, right? So if your starting point is a monetary policy rule where you have the inflation rate on the right-hand side, the shock and the inflation rate cannot be orthogonal if you're gonna argue from within a new Keynesian framework, okay? There are reasons why we don't think the bias here is very large, but there is certainly some bias here. Having said that, and we're working on this now, that's a really interesting um, econometric theory question too that we are scratching now. But what we see is this is zero, this is one, okay? Above this, you are determinant, okay? So up to about 2010, and actually up to 2010, it's just because the central bank was proactive in the global financial crisis. So they began to cut rates before inflation began to came down, come down. And that's why it seems like it's gone down here, but it's really is somewhere here, okay? About 2010, the coefficient is no longer one. Soon after, it's no longer anything. You cannot reject zero, okay? Now, that's really the definition of your indeterminacy world. So now we can ask, well, what gives? Um, this is a new Keynesian model, the three equation model with some basic bells and whistles. So what we're looking at here is the output gap here. So this is an IS curve, okay? And I have a Phillips curve here. And the funky thing is the policy rule where you can have small deviations to the policy parameters so they can move around a little bit, or you can have regime shifts of them, okay? That's this. And these equations here just describe how those things work. The key is to say, okay, I can imagine a regime in which the Taylor principle is not satisfied. I can imagine a regime in which the Taylor principle is satisfied. I can rig this. This is not estimated. It's not calibrated either. This is just proof of concept, okay? So I can rig it such that globally this is determinate. And then I ask, what happens if I get the same shock in the you know, good regime and the bad regime, okay? And what happens is in the good regime, inflation goes up, that's an inflation shock, and then comes back down. In the bad regime, it goes up like crazy and then comes back down very slowly, okay? So that's the sense in which you lose control of inflation. But this one is symmetric. If there were a negative inflation shock, I would have seen in the bad regime, inflation falling a lot more, which clearly is at odds with 
what we've seen in Turkey, but also you know what we see in any weak policy regime environment. Okay, so we say, okay, how about this? Imagine that I have an effective offer bound. Somebody should write a version of this with a rule based on changes. That is, you're allowed to lower interest rates but not raise them. That causes different types of difficulties mechanically because the offer bound level begins to trickle down then, right? But that's a good question to think about. Here, what we have is, you know, you're told policy rates shall not be about 5%, okay? What gives? What gives is this. You get a policy shock, okay? Again, an inflation shock. If the upper bound isn't binding, you jack up your policy rate, control inflation, you're done, you're happy. If the upper, but notice that, you know, you jack up the interest rate, it begins to come back down very quickly. Michael, this is for you, right? If you're hitting the upper bound, now you have to stay at that upper bound for a long time to make up for that difference, okay? And that's really not good enough. It doesn't control the inflation shock at the get-go. Thus, you end up with inflation. You know, that's a huge difference here. And this only applies when you have an inflation shock to the upside, because nothing is stopping you from cutting rates in this environment. Okay. But, and but this, I, I think, think, is going to yeah. One quick thing, but the, it, it, I'm slightly surprised that the policy rate doesn't overshoot. So, so, so as soon as it rehits that, you know, the the black line path is back crossing the upper bound, you're back on that path. So you, you don't quite table mountain it. You just, you just suffer oh, more. So for this a, is, actually, it's, it's an interesting question. I don't know whether that's a, it, it's a theorem uh, or it so happens in this instance, right? So that, this is worth thinking about. Um, I, I cannot tell you that, yes, in an environment of this sort, that will always happen. Okay. Yeah, but um, well observed. Okay. Um, but the point here is, and I'd like to really emphasize this, we like to, especially if you're central bankers, you know this, right? You know, the new Keynesian model gives you a very good mindset, a theoretical environment to think about policy. But usually we think of it in the, you know, determinate, well-behaved, you know, um, nice, nice environment. Um, and then if somebody says, what happens if uh, the polite word we use here is inane policy, right? Um, well, inane policy is also part of the new Keynesian framework, and the answer it provides there are as good, right? Now, I'd like to spend the next 10 minutes or so, um, and I'm very happy to take questions. Um, and on the, on the side, um, Evangelos has asked, to what extent can the Central Bank of Turkey now be declared independent and politically free? Um, it kind of hinges on what exactly now uh, refers to here. I don't think even now, now, it's all that independent and politically free. But in this environment, it certainly wasn't. And I'm going to show you examples of that. Okay. So now um, the president and previously prime minister had been for more than a decade saying, you know, it's not good enough that you're not raising rates. You have to lower interest rates. The only acceptable interest rate is zero, blah, blah, blah. Okay. In the summer of 2021, it comes out and in some press conference briefing, whatever, says, this is from Bloomberg, no more high interest rates um, because high interest rates would bring us higher inflation. This is really extremely good example to teach you know, people just learning statistics, the difference between correlation and causality. Okay. Um, and, and then he says, also at the time, inflation is... I would say two and a half times the target, okay? And he says, inflation is going to come down. This is his words. It's not possible for inflation to accelerate further from now on because we are transiting to lower interest rates, right? So his world is higher interest rates cause higher inflation. Since we're gonna cut interest rates with lower interest rates, inflation is going to come down too, okay? And then, um, Evangelos, um, just in case it wasn't clear enough, he says, this is the week before the central bank's policy meeting. He says, I'm giving, I guess I'm giving the signal to somewhere. Okay. So now we're all, you know, holy crap. They're going to cut interest rates next week. Okay. And next week comes and the central bank does not cut interest rates. 
And in fact, um, they have a defiant, Sun was this the agreed upon word? Um, this was the single most contentious point in writing this paper that and Sun won that uh, we call this I guess, defiant, right? I don't remember what I wanted to call it. I wanted something else. I wanted something, a stronger word. It was uh, indignant. That, uh, hmm? You wanted indignant. And I yes, yes. Defiant. I still think indignant is better. Right. I think defiant right? is correct. We can talk um, about it again. Uh, uh, whatever. Okay, you got your way. Um, right. Is but the just, central just, bank just, statement. Just, just for fun, this actually sounds like probably a lot of central bank discussions about what words to put in the statement or the, you know, do you want it significantly stronger or do you want markedly stronger? It's Absolutely. good to hear that academics are having the same debates in the central bank communication literature. Yep, 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 yep. Um, now, the reason why is, um, I thought it was indignant, is <clears throat> that... Um, you know, decisively until a significant fall in inflation reports forecast path, okay? And that says, you know, again, decisively, all labor inflation, pursuit of primary project price stability, policy rate will continue to determine at the level above inflation to maintain a strongest inflationary effect until strong indicators point to a permanent fall in inflation and the medium term 5% target is reached, okay? I think indignant is very good, right? You know, who, me, you expect me to lower interest rates while inflation is high, never. Okay, fine. Now, what is cool here is that one, monetary policy wasn't tight at all, but they said current tight monetary policy stands. Okay, um, but at least it was clear, you know, you read current tight monetary policy stance will be maintained decisively until significant fall in inflation. Okay, now this is August. In September, we learned that inflation has gone up. And this was the last statement. So clearly, any modicum of self-respect and internal consistency implies that if you weren't lowering interest rates then and said, until inflation falls, I'm not going to do this. Now that inflation has gone further up, you will surely not lower interest rates. But they cut the policy rates in September. Right? So that's the beginning of the Turkish market bloodshed. And that's a large cut. It's a 100 basis point cut. Okay. And we're like, you know, my God, man. And comes October, we're talking about, you know, surely they're not going to do it again. No, no, maybe they're going to do another 50. They're going to do another 100. No, no way. They do another 200 basis point cut. Okay. All right. Um, and, and they cut rates until the year end. All right. So now let's see what happens. This is something I cannot fit into one graph because the scale goes crazy. Dollar to lira begins at about eight, okay? And this is where the president's speech that I showed you was, okay? This was the MPC, and then this was the MPC where they cut rates. Two of the deputy governors apparently dragged their feet in doing so. So in between, they were let go. And that's your politically independence question, okay? Um, fun anecdote. I had a short position uh, on Liras, as any same person would have. And um, the night before these guys were fired, I called my broker and said, let's close this, you know, made a good amount of money. Uh, she was a former student, actually. And she said, Hojam, uh, so now you think that the Liras is going to appreciate her. She made fun of me. And I said, okay, damn it, leave it there. So the next morning, we woke up to the news that these guys were fired and the Lira plummeted again. Um, and of course, um, that was very good for my short position. So I called her and said, you know, I should buy you lunch. And she said, no, you should buy the president lunch. Okay. Um, <laughs> right. So then they cut rates again. Okay. And then they cut rates again. Okay. And then they cut rates again. Now notice here, now the exchange rate is at 16. Okay. Eight. This, so that's a, that's a sizable depreciation of the data. Something we now know is at about um, early-ish December, the Turkish banking system is very sound and well-run. And there is a separate talk to be given on how the Turkish regulator was all about forcing the banks to do unreasonably credit expansionary policies and how the banks were trying not to do that. That's really fascinating because normally 
the game between the regulator and the regulatee is regulatees try to go crazy, regulator tries to stop them. In Turkey, the regulator was telling banks, you know, unless you're, uh, unless you're funding yourself sufficiently with um, non-core liabilities, we're going to find you, okay? You know, a high fraction of non-core liabilities is anywhere in the world signed for alarm. And the Turkish regulator was forcing the banks to do this. And the banks were finding sideways methods of not doing it, okay? But the point here was, as you would imagine, while the lira was still used for transactions, people were just en masse running away from it as a savings tool, okay? So the system was dollarizing like crazy, but it was dollarizing within the system. So they were converting their lira deposits to dollar deposits. The banks apparently went to the government and said, things have become so volatile that people are losing faith in the system. They are asking for physical cash and transfers to outside the country. We're in very good shape, but we can only withstand this for under two weeks, okay? Monday midnight, the government came out and said, okay, we're instituting exchange protected accounts. And we're like, you know, what the hell? Very unclear, no guidance, no explanation, no bylaws, anything. But the gist of it is banks are going to offer special accounts where you're going to deposit liras for a term deposit. At maturity, we're going to compare your interest income to what you would have made had you bought dollars at the initiation and how much income you would have made by now. Okay, And if you have, would have made more in dollars, the bank is going to make you whole for the difference. And the treasury and the central bank is going to make whole for that. Okay. Now, people were like, you know, what is this? How is it going to work? Whatever. Here is something Rafael, fascinating just, for you. just purely out of interest, were, were they symmetric? So if you would, if you made no, more, no, so no, 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 no. The a, government is giving you a free option, free option. On, the, on the dollar. Okay. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> This is the midnight when this happened. And this jump on that day in the Turkish CDS is in response to that. And what you see is while everybody was trying to understand what is going on, um, the financial markets actually had figured out that Turkey is converting effects risk into government solvency risk. And this really is a very good example of financial markets kind of collectively understanding, figuring out, and pricing things correctly. As a result of that, of course, the Turkish CDS spread goes up to 900, okay? Because Lira continues to depreciate, and now Lira depreciation is mechanically tied to budgetary outlays. This is something now we're trying to wiggle out of, and it's extremely difficult because, you know, whatever deposits that the banking system reports as Lira now is exchange protected, the burden on the treasury is insane. The central bank is trying to force the banks gently to um, entice them, make them roll over these exchange protected accounts at less than 100%. The problem, of course, is that means people are ending up with liras, not in exchange protected accounts. What do they do with those liras? They buy dollars. Okay. And those dollars have to come out of the central bank's reserves. And those reserves, since the central bank, while doing these inane policies over the past decade, didn't want the exchange rate to depreciate too fast because that's the red signal in the Turkish economy. Not only because it's destructive on its own right, that too, but whenever the lira depreciates too fast, people decide that the economy is badly run and things are bad. And that's very, very bad in an election season, and Turkey is in this continuous election life. So they were doing this stupid policy and were trying to offset the effect on the exchange rate by selling the reserves. And they were trying to bolster the reserves by doing cross-currency swaps with the banks in Turkey. Again, a fascinating story that I'm not going to get into unless you really want me to. But the result of that is currently the net of swaps, net reserves of the Central Bank of Turkey are about minus $60 billion, okay? Meaning, if you are giving people liras and they're gonna buy dollars with that, there is, a, there is no source of those dollars, okay? Cool. 
Next up. Uh, in in fact, just, just, just quickly, yeah. uh, uh, I know we're crossing the hour mark, but we're just going to keep going until quarter past and we'll get through the last few slides. But I wanted to ask uh, a question. So, do, and I think I could guess the answer, but I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll wait to hear it. Um, you said that the financial markets had worked out that there's the, that the government was swapping exchange rate risk for sovereign debt risk. Yep. Did the government realize they were doing that or was that a that a sort of unintended consequence of a policy they just thought would be popular? Hard to know. Early on, they didn't because recall that announcement led to a sharp appreciation of the lira. So, you know, at the beginning, it seemed like this is great. We're giving them the option, but the option is so out of the money that it's costing us nothing. OK, that's here. Some of this was because they wanted to make it seem that this is working so well, they were also selling dollars like crazy and forcing the banks and private firms, whatnot, to follow suit. But then, um, you know, once the, and, and the problem, of course, is, you know, people were slowly getting into that exchange protected system here. They were really getting into it here. And then the lira was depreciating again. So this is 10, right? And currently it's 28 and a half. OK, um, now, even people so uneducated about economics and finance, there is no way they wouldn't understand we're going to promise people to pay them if the lira depreciates. OK, we'll have to pay them a lot. They must have seen this. But, okay. but, but I guess it's a bit reminiscent of in the financial crisis, governments like my own in Ireland who decided that, you know, if we underwrite all of the banking assets on the government's balance sheet, there's an equilibrium where it actually never has to be delivered on. And then you save the world without having to do anything. But once it ended up looking like they would have to do something, um, bad things. Yeah. OK, so this is a former chapter of the Turkish um, economic history where in 2000, when we had fixed exchange rates um, and were trying to stabilize, the banking system at the time was in terrible shape. And one of the old glorious banks failed November 2000. And there was going to be a run on the banking system. So the government said, OK, we're underwriting the entire liabilities of the banking system, everything. OK, the result was a twin crisis and government bankruptcy in February 2001. And in fact, one of the best papers ever written in economics is by Burnside, Eichenbaum, and Rebello called um, Prospective Deficits and the Asian Financial Crisis, where they say well, the 98 Asian crisis is exactly this mechanism that you were talking about, that it doesn't have to be a law the strong enough belief that the government is not going to let the banking system fail in a system where the banking system has foreign currency short position, essentially borrowing in foreign currency and lending in domestic currency, okay? If the government underwrites this and people test it, the local currency will depreciate because the government cannot produce the foreign currency liability without resorting to seniorage. And that seniorage is consistent with depreciation of the currency, hence you actually create the run equilibrium. It's a great, beautiful paper and you would like it given that you're thinking along these lines already. Okay, so back to the Turkish case. I had, that paper was a working paper in 2000. And when the, I was a graduate student then, when the Turkish government had this blanket guarantee, I was like, what, what, what? These guys already told us that this is going to happen, right? So it took all four months in the Turkish case um, for the run equilibrium to materialize. So as the central bank was cutting the policy rate, there goes your, you know, very strong New Fisherian experiment. This is your inflation, okay? We cut this at the end of the year where inflation, notice that inflation is supposed to be very sluggish, doesn't respond all that fast, whatever. Actually, when people realize that your central bank has gone completely, you know, cuckoo, price stickiness isn't all that strong, okay? So, you know, we go from 14% inflation in, Jan in June to 35% in December to 85% in the spring. 
uh, I'm happy to report that is all the way down to 65% as of today. Now, the other fascinating thing here is what was happening to the market rates as the central bank was cutting the policy rate. Okay. What you're looking at here is again, the policy rate being cut. This is your consumer loan rate, the red line. This is a term rate, right? And this is the government's five-year borrowing rate. These things are going off the scale. Why? Very obviously, you are not only not able to change the beliefs about the steady state down, but people look at what your central bank is doing and say, you know, inflation is going to go through the roof. Essentially, the central bank is abdicating and inflation will go through the roof. If that's your expectation, are you going to lend at any low interest rate? Obviously not. So market rates go up like crazy. So what happens is you cut the policy rate, inflation goes up, and interest rates also go up. That's a shamefully horrible constellation of economic outcomes. And the government hates this. Now, in the Vox EU column, I think we have nice language for this, that that's the sense in which if the politics is strong enough to strong arm the central bank to do these inane policies, it's strong enough to do other things too. And usually, this weak monetary policy turns out to be the thin edge of you know, things going down the drain wedge, where the central bank and the government sees market rates going up. They see it as a thumb in their eyes. Okay, you know, they're doing this to spite us. They hate it, so they regulate it. If I'd actually plotted this further out, you'd have seen these market rates come down very strongly. Why? Because the bank are told, you know, more or less in these words, nice bank you got there, shame if something were to happen to it. We hated that as we are trying to institute the low interest rate environment, you're jacking up your lending rates. So banks cut the lending rates. You pass regulations that says banks have to hold an inordinate amount of government bonds. If they don't, they're gonna pay huge fees. So you create this artificial demand for government bonds. There was a time when in an environment of 80% inflation, the nominal Turkish lira 10-year note rate was below the dollar 10-year note rate. This should be impossible, but effectively, if you turn the financial markets into a command economy, anything goes. But then allocatively, it's a mess. So somebody has asking, you know, what about the redistributional impacts of such a monetary policy? Of course, if you were able to borrow at these ridiculous rates and then buy property, car, whatever you could buy, right? Banks were lending at minus 50% real rate. If you were able to borrow, you were great. But that led to this huge credit boom. And it was clear that that was feeding the inflation. So the central bank said, okay, I want low rates, but I don't want you to lend too much. It doesn't work. The price and the quantity are no longer compatible. So the central bank helpfully said, I'll tell you who to lend to. Okay. And that's the big redistributional effect, right? Hence, what we see here is one, um, if you are an applied economist of any sort looking for large macro exogenous variation, take a look at Turkey. We have some issues with inflation data, whatnot, but in general, actually Turkish data tends to be very good. And we have very good, you know, household level, firm level, labor market, whatnot data. So, you know, if you're applied interested in those things and you're thinking, you know, if only I had an experiment where, you know, inflation went crazy or financial markets died, right? Take a look at the Turkish case, right? Um, if you wanted to tell your students and friends and family that this PPP thing that makes so much sense in theory, it actually makes so much sense in application too. It does. You just need large enough inflation differentials. Take a look at the Turkish case. The new Keynesian model, don't let people badmouth the new Keynesian model because it's so simple. It's simple, beautiful, it works. If you want to understand what happens in a failed new Keynesian, uh, in a, well, <laughs> new Fisherian experiment, Okay, the new Keynesian model is going to tell you inflation is going to go through the roof. It does. Very importantly, 
this neo-fisherianism, I'd like to be very clear here. neo fisherian people use these almost like substitutes. Neo-fisherianism isn't anything like MMT, modern monetary theory. There is no modern monetary theory. There is no way of making sense of that argument, okay? Neo-fisherianism is actually by the book. It could happen. We understand the circumstances under which it could happen. But we have a sentence in the paper that says, where neo-fisherian disinflations fail, new Keynesian this, um, indeterminacy begins. And that's the risk that you're taking. So neo-fisherianism, unless Michael made this observation at the very beginning of the seminar, neo-fisherianism, unless you are very sure of your communication and credibility, unless you are very clearly able to tell people, you know, look, we decided that our 3% inflation target is too high. We're going to go to a 2.5% inflation target. And since you are so buying this, I'm already going to lower the interest rate by 50 basis points. Okay? And everybody is like, yeah, yeah, okay, we now all understand that, you know, there is a level shift in this process. Maybe. But if you're going to use this to combat inflation above your target already, if you're going to think that, ooh, you know, I'm going to have my cake and eat it too, because Martin Uribe told me, you know, I can do it. He actually told you, you may be lucky and it may work out. But that's not the only equilibrium outcome of that experiment. And the more likely outcome is that it's going to blow in your face. And if it blows up in your face, Turkey is what it looks like. And it's really a sad outcome. Okay. And that's not only for, you know, this is not the kind of thing that one would say, yeah, you know, Turkey, yeah, weird things happen. Okay. It's nothing unique to Turkey, right? If Trump had his way with the Fed, this would have happened in the US. Right. So um, it's really important to understand that monetary policy frameworks are really important. And it's not just the current setting of the policy, but the general understanding of that framework. And if you mess with that, you're actually messing with a very fragile equilibrium argument. And if you break it, very difficult to put it back together again. Thank you. Left myself muted. That is perfect. Thanks so much, Rafet. Uh, that was a tour de force, as always. Um, there, there was one other comment from Evangelos. I, I can email it to you. It's a comment about uh, Xerxes and ancient... Oh, yeah, I see it. it. It's on my screen. So, yeah. yes. Um, yeah. but, uh, I, I'm going to end with two, two things. One is, um, I think you're right about MMT, because it, I, I, I don't think... I mean, I've read the books, and I try and read the bits that people write. But, yeah, uh, if you try to put it... If I, if I were to think, if you tried to model it fully in the way that you or I would think about modeling something, I actually think the failure of it would be similar. It would be a credibility, trust in the system thing that would take it down. You know, it, it seemed to be based on a view that if you start printing money, everyone just carries on business as usual and no one internalizes that the value of what they're getting is going to suddenly change. So th there may be a similarity there, that's, uh, but I agree, with, I agree with your basic point. And the last one would be just to reinforce what you said. Uh, and I say this sitting in, in the UK, um, we had our own experiment with uh, uh, destroying or calling into question the credibility of macro policy frameworks. And uh, I, I hope I'm not overstepping by saying, I, I think the UK was generally well regarded for the uh, frameworks it had, but even then very quickly, you can you can destroy credibility in in, in a in a almost spectacular fashion, and then then you're left scrambling with depreciating exchange rate and uh, higher inflation than equivalent countries. Now we didn't get up to eighty five percent, but uh, double digits nonetheless. And and so yeah, I think these are these are important lessons. Um, Mehmet has raised a hand. Mehmet, have you have you uh, you've written a question? So let's get let's finish on this one. Uh, the question is why does... I, I, okay, you know, I see the question again. And and yes, uh, so the question is, who cares about the repo rate? You know, couldn't the banks have handled this in a sense internally as a market mechanism and um, offer deposit rates consistent with inflation? Two answers to that, um, maybe three. One is the theoretical answer where it does matter what the central bank is doing because essentially, if I'm a bank, and the central bank tells me that, you know, look, 
you can get reserves from me at whatever, 11%, okay? Or you can collect deposits at 30%. I'm not going to want that, right? I'm going to go for the 11%. That's the sense in which the central bank's policy rate is a relevant rate that affects things. And that's the sense in which this is the old, you know, sergeant point where if monetary policy is divorced from the real world, so to speak, right? Uh, terrible things will happen because that rate actually matters, okay? The other answer is actually Turkish banks did this and offered deposits at higher rates and loans at higher rates. And, uh, and the government and the central bank said, you know, what kind of traitors are you? Here we are trying to institute a low interest rates regime and you're jacking up interest rates and, you know, um, you'll be very sorry for having done this, but not. So they were regulated to follow the policy rate too. Uh, okay, we're going to end on one more because one more has come in, and it's a uh, it's about the um, the start of the exchange protected uh, deposits. Uh, 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 at the I don't beginning, I quite understand you... this actually. Um... I think the question here, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the question says, you know. Um, Currently, too, the central bank is now raising interest rates some, but that's not leading to an appreciation of the lira, whereas this institution of the exchange protected accounts actually made the lira appreciate. So that seems to be a stronger policy tool than the interest rate. Um, that's an iffy thing. But yes, in general, of course, regulation is a heavier handed tool, right? You know, if you can tell people that, you know, this is the price, this is the quantity, rather than guiding them with your policy actions. Uh, that kind of works strongly, um, but usually with a lot of side effects. Having said that, um, the talk in the markets and the anecdotal evidence is that a lot of the appreciation of the lira at the time was actually due to a huge sale of reserves from the central bank and not gentle moral suasion on not only banks, but also large effects deposit holding companies that you ought to sell and convert to effects protected. And that sale of dollars to convert into effects protected was what led to this appreciation. But again, it's not very clear that this was a um, you know, voluntary market response to the policy action rather than being strong, strong armed into making it as if the policy was working very well. Excellent. On that, I'm afraid we're going to have to cut it. Um, Rafet, as always, it's a pleasure hearing from you. It's a super interesting case. And as I said, has has, and as you emphasized, uh, it, it has important salutary lessons for all of us interested in policymaking and institutions. Um, and the importance of good economics comes through. Um, to everybody else, thank you for joining. And yeah, uh, keep keep looking at your emails for the announcement of the next one, which will hopefully be next month. Good. Until then, Looking have a forward. good evening, everybody. Great to see everyone. Thank you so Bye. very much. Bye-bye.